So you're both legs out of the
Let's go on that. Let's go on that. So you want four points. So you and me. And the same thing on these two at the back there, yeah? Yeah. Okay. But it's different, isn't it? Yeah. So am I doing it better or the same thing? Yeah, you could like so that like, point and hit like that. So like, oh, like, you're really sort of intrigued. I don't know. Yeah, and then pull back like trust with you. Yeah. Yeah.
that are on this PowerPoint that I will after the speaking email to pull from. Okay. Um, yeah, so what basically Kevin and I are planning is a, uh, an enriching, exciting, racing, dance, slash performing arts, slash drama, they're the curriculum areas that essentially involve experience in the West End of London, okay. which will involve us uh, travelling up to London on a Friday, getting involved in a whole series of activities uh, uh, based in and around the West End on the Friday and the Saturday, um, and then returning home by Barbara on the Saturday night. Work, contemporary work, so kind of go and have a look at, try 
going to be exposed to two different strands of dance treatment called commercial and and some called abstract treatments of, of dance as well. So we will be kind of tubing it, walking around London, going to different um, dance studios and kind of trying out some dance classes. Okay, so this is the details. On the Friday, uh, we will approximately, these times are approximate, and they, they could certainly change. Um, the plan is to go up on the train, um, Barbara Lane, um, checking for the hotel about 12 o'clock. First kind of thing that we'll do all together is a, a, a national theatre, the Royal National Theatre on the South Bank, uh, do a, a Royal Choir backstage tour. Okay, so we'll all together go on the backstage tour, have a look at the, uh, the way we've got this together at the national. Uh, costume, props, scenic kind of elements, lighting, sound, you name it, all the production elements, a really, really interesting guided tour of the Royal National Theatre, one of our favorite theatres in the country. A little bit of uh, free time uh, factored in uh, around kind of theatre land, and obviously uh, a close to the time we'll have various meetings and that will be distributed. Organs on regs and things like that, but an opportunity for you to have a little wander around theatre land as well. Um, then at five o'clock, kind of a pre theatre dinner, there we are, a little, a little light supper before um, uh, the first show, okay, at 7 30. And the plan is there for us to probably separate off a little bit uh, for the drama performing arts crew for us to go and see what's supposed to be a fringe show. Be off West End, slightly like smaller, more intimate sort of venue. Um, obviously, subject to what is going on at the time. Uh, but that'll be really And dance, students will go off. Yeah, maybe we're going to see a bit of contemporary work, maybe Sadler's Bells, Peacock Theatre, something like that. We'll have a look. So we've got the, the, the backstage tour, we've got the fringe and dance show. Then uh, obviously, we're turning back to the hotel at 10 30 pm. Inspector the hotel that we booked is on Southern Bridge Road, uh, which is very, very close to the South Bank. Nice hotel. Um, okay, so on the Saturday, uh, we plan to visit the Victoria and Albert Museum, okay, which is in Kensington, which has an absolutely fabulous performing arts section. There are lots of archive kind of information. Lots of uh, exhibitions and installations, and really interesting dance, performing arts, and drama-related um, um, works in there. That, that that looks really fab. I think and myself, it's great. We have a really really good experience. To have a look at that in terms of kind of deepening your understanding. Um, a little bit of lunch, uh, and then again we separate off. The plan is this is uh, dance doing their workshops at Pineapple um, and dance works, we would see as a drama performing arts a matinee performance of another show. Okay, so that's the second show. Uh, possibly something like perhaps with the Royal National Theatre, so not necessarily fringe, but sort of taking a kind of sort of interest in the nature of taking a step up a little bit. Um, with the accent very much on trying to give you a range of experience. So you see different kinds of things, and that will be my thinking and my plan, and then this plan when we book the events. Obviously, I'm talking yet, because it's a bit far off. But we do, we'll do it in such a way that, that it provides breadth, doing different things. Okay. That'll be a matinee performance there. Um, around about that time, we need to come check out the theatre, up in the hotel. Um, a, little, a little brief theatre dinner, supper so to speak, together, and then all together for, I guess, what you might describe as the more traditional, conventional West End musical. The more, much more kind of commercial enterprise, the, the, the bigger shows, and probably we're all together yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, that'll involve dance, that'll involve music, that'll involve drama, the, 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 the uh, true friend. Um, finishing up about 10.30, and then I'll be travelling back to Waterloo and we'll be home again, approximate timing as well, as well. Yeah. So very quickly in a nutshell, we've got a backstage tour, we've got uh, 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 evening, Friday evening performance, we've got a trip to the B&A, 
we've got uh, matinee performance on the Saturday or uh, dance works pineapple workshop. We've got uh, major West End musical at the end of it. Uh, essentially, got five activities and a bit of free time and around. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Now cost. Uh, looking at somewhere in the region of about two hundred pounds. I want to kind of trying to keep my DVD with a little bit of cost a little bit lower. That's going to be the sort of cost. And obviously that's a that factor. Dinner. Um, and, and so you might have to discuss with your parents and get your own bank balances or whatever to that kind of time ahead. Um, this includes travel, accommodation, all the stated itinerary there. Not include uh, that. Breakfast with that as well, okay. uh, but not lunch, not evening meal, uh, and obviously any yeah, spend. Okay. Uh, plan would be uh, for that to be payable in two installments. That would be probably how we'll set it up. Okay. Uh, now, this is another important factor. The place is limited. We want to take 30 students. Yeah. There are about 40, 45 in here. There have been about 10 expressions of email interest that can't make it to the meeting by email. Okay. So, as it stands, there looks to be slightly more interest than there are places. Although, said that. So to that end, obviously we've got to factor the possibility of this being oversubscribed. Okay, um, you've got to. Uh, uh, go, yeah, um, you've got to consider your finance, your availability. Um, you've got to understand the trip as a study support and experience in something a bit different. It isn't just you know, have a great time, have a good time. It's going to be lots of memories, hopefully you know, fun, um, but obviously you know. Has a link to what you're doing here. Um, okay, so, so this is important, and I will email this to you all. So you'll have this as as as, as there. Okay. We need to obviously discuss with parents. Um, and you need to email after this an expression of interest, which doesn't tie you in. It just says, yeah, no, I'm up for this, I want to do this, I want to do this. Okay. We like you to do that by Sunday the 7th of April. Okay. So, yeah, John performing arts to me, do that for side of things, dance to uh, Emily. And you also, so an expression of interest will, will sort of come from your parents. Such you are endorsing chapter discussing it. Yeah. I don't want to get to July and all of a sudden I get a phone call from the parents saying, What is it to do? I'm going to learn the thing. My daughter could not eat. I've had that before. Uh, so, I don't want that. Um, so, okay, so, so uh, uh, an acknowledgement both of the parents and they have to go on this trip. Um, and you also need to email a response to this question. What I hope to get out of the experience is how it's going to support my AT studies. Okay? Simple as that. And uh, max 50 words. And obviously, should the trip show expressions of interest beyond the numbers which were allocated? Then obviously we've got to look at the sort of selecting. Decisions. Um, and the way we do that is by looking at things like academic progress, okay, which is it's something, something we always do with enrichment practice. Anyway, it's keeping having kept up to date with the work. 
having made reasonable progress in that subject. So then, to punch you out, those sorts of qualities that need to be, you know, rock solid, proper bottoms in terms of the courses you take before enriching activities of this nature of the two. Uh, also, we'll look at the email responses. Yep. Emily and I will discuss them, what he said, what we'll to get out of it. Yep. Uh, you know, <coughs> as fair as can be. Um, and then, as a final, final resort, um, we, we will follow kind of college colors, such as, such as uh, uh, ballot and uh, things out of hands. But obviously, we'll have like to go through But all of that is only if it is over the dry end. There's lots of water to go over the dry end. Yeah. Okay. So that's an escalation. Yeah, I was just wondering if anyone's got any questions. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah, that's the question. Um, if you take drama and dance, if you have to separate the time to like on the Friday, go to the French performance, Saturday, do dance, or was it just for the dance or drama? Um, that might be tricky in terms of booking. We were expecting just two spoke groups where it's time to get together. So if we start picking and choosing, I'm not sure whether that would be yeah. possible. Like say, it's a little bit easier for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not not I can see your commitment, but if you could just say that within your email, and then if you're happy to do one or the other, if there's tight numbers in either, then you put in one or the other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. Good, yeah. Oh, that's all together. Can you watch? I mean, you could do, you could do that either way. I mean, if you, I mean, if your parent just emails me, says, "Yeah, I'm referring you from my daughter, and I trust this," fine, that's great. Um, if you, in your email, say, "I've discussed this with my parents," you know, that's again because I've got it. I have no knowledge of this. They took a problem, or something like that. Not that you would do, of course. Uh, I could say, ah, yes, but on the uh, 28th of April, they said that they had a conversation. Any more questions? About what we're going to do, or where we're going to be? Yeah. Well, we've got a, we've got a wish list, haven't we? Well, we've got, yeah, we've got a decision to make there, and, and, I, and I think once we, once we get the people that are going to go on the trip, I think, I think it'd be, be nice to involve you in that, in that kind yeah, of Yeah, we've done that before. When I went to the trip to New York, we discussed those who were going. We had a bit of a kind of tally of favourites. Yeah. Yeah, obviously we're not going to be able to please everybody, but there could be a consensus of which one we're feeling for. So obviously we're just holding on that decision now to involve the Yeah. Incidentally, the hotel is likely to be the likely to be the Not single, not single, not single rooms kind of thing. Uh, you know, just, just. And obviously we, we, we will do it in a sensitive and kind of chatting to you sort of way, whereby, you know, yeah, you're, you're, you're teaming up with a friend, you know. And <laughs> I'm hoping to do a range, like you said, so more commercial classes and then sort of technical classes and so do the range. But how is it more commercial where the dance works we get a further range of Oh, yeah. And I'll email you this uh, and the information. You don't have to necessarily wait to accept to do it, you just you'll do it. Yeah, try to get in early, yeah. Express the interest and then your physical words kind of. Uh, but I'll email you this, this PowerPoint. Okay, is there any other questions? If you have and you don't want to ask it out loud, yeah.
Yes. Check us all just email us.
No, 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 that's that's good setup. Please. Okay.
Alex. And Zani. Oh, Zani. It's real private time, but I'm almost Oh, really? Well, yeah. What are you doing? Exactly. Uh, I'm doing English, History, Maths, and Economics. What about you? English, History, uh, Philosophy, and Law. What history? Uh, modern. Who's your teacher? Martin Thomas. Oh, no, come on. Who's your teacher? Um, Edward. The young one. Because oh, you're back, like, among the bad people. Yeah. Right, mine is too. I thought we could, yeah. That's what I'm thinking, right? She said. Go to the back, and I'm like, yeah, we're first here, and we get the worst seats. Yeah, I know. And right. then, I mean, I can't sit with us in not. Yeah. Yeah. Because apparently, it gets so overcrowded that sometimes I have to watch it from the video link and the foyer. Really? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's probably good that you've got here, right? Yeah, and we get these seats. It's good. Do you want to just go down? I could do. Do not leave any spaces, folks, with right into the middle. I mean, people late to get a seat for late numbers. Does that mean you can't do it? Is it okay if you keep this in food? Oh, that's separate. These are separate. Oh, okay. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Huh? Are we allowed to save seats then? No. Or not? Alright. It's just a big one. They might have to do it. Oh, there's no attention. Yeah. I guess it's. Yeah, no, James is at the seat. Yeah. You went to the seat. Um, one. One. Just to warn you guys that I've got the uh, camera right behind you, which is uh, sending it out to the foyer, so um, we may or may not be using that depending on how many people arrive. But if I imagine it's probably not a good idea to whisper things because you're booming out into the foyer. Because <laughs> that's the little microphone sitting on top of it. But um, yeah, now on the screen. You wouldn't mind uh, warning the other people who arrive in this kind of facility down very kind of Yeah, well, that's the little camera sitting up there. Live on YouTube. Sure do love volunteering. Oh, I'll see you later, but...
I'm assistant principal at the Sixth Form College and my role is to be responsible for information, advice and guidance for all our students. Basically I'm in charge of careers. A special responsibility for links with higher education. And um, this must be, I've lost track, probably about the 20th event we've had where we've invited students and their parents to find out more about the University of Oxford, Cambridge. Um, I'm going to introduce all the people who are here so you'll know who to direct your questions to. And um, it's going to be a short presentation, an opportunity for lots of questions, because I think you'll probably learn more from your questions. Okay. So um, first of all, I'd like to greet our visitors from uh, Cambridge, Dr. Carolyn Crawford, and from Oxford, Dr. Lizzie Emerson. And they will be speaking to you in their role as admissions tutors of the universities. Um, over here, we have some of our former students who were here sitting in there two years ago, listening to this talk. <coughs> they actually are studying now at Oxford and Cambridge, so um, we'll they'll talk to you a little bit later on and tell you what they're doing. And here we have Diana Hartley, who is a tutor with responsibility for applications to Cambridge, and Leslie Maddox, who looks after the, tu the students who are applying to Oxford. There is quite a lot of work to do to get into Oxford and Cambridge. It requires you to think and also to be organised and to plan. So we do have um, a sort of big support mechanism to help you. Um, I'm going to be quiet now and I'm going to let our visitors speak. At the end of the session, I'll just give you some information about what we do within college to support the applications and some details and information about the visits in the open day. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Lizzie Emerson, as Helen said. I'm a chief for admissions and at St. Hugh's College, Oxford. First of all, can everybody hear me? If you can't, please wave from the back. Um, I'm going to talk for just five or ten minutes about what I think is different about Oxford and Cambridge. In other words, why are you here? Why are you having a special session? What makes us? What sets us apart? Then I'm going to pass to Carolyn, who's going to talk about the admissions process, and I will jump in with differences between Oxford and Cambridge. I studied history originally at Cambridge, that's also where I did my doctoral study, and I moved across to Oxford. Um, so if you want to ask questions about the difference, I'm sure you can ask either of us, but I might have some things to offer there. Um, but why are we different? Why are you having an Oxford and Cambridge session? Well, I think it's very important to stress that in many ways we are not different. We are just another two universities in a very good set of the UK and around the world. But I think there are two things that set us apart. And those uh, are the things that you will be looking at at this stage and deciding whether if we offer a subject, if you like, you might like to study 
familiar with this. But it is important to say, first of all, that the most important choice to make is the subject and not the place. The place must come second. When you do a degree, it's doing the same subject every day for three or four years of your life. You have to love it. That's what makes it work. So I suppose the most important message is don't choose Oxford and Cambridge unless we do something that you actually want to study. It sounds an obvious thing to say, but we do often get applicants who feel that they ought somehow to go to Oxford and Cambridge just because Oxford and Cambridge are very good. And that's not really a good reason. A good reason is if we do something that you like and you like the idea of our teaching and learning system and our college system as well. So those are the two things I'm going to talk about. The teaching and learning system at Oxford and Cambridge and our college system. And for me, the first of those, the way that we do our teaching and learning, is by far the most important. And that, for me, is the thing that sets us apart and gives us a little bit of something different from other universities. So whichever university you go to, you will get learning in at least two of the following forms. You will get lectures, which will be like this, a talking textbook, PowerPoint, information, and soaking up kind of session. You will get seminars and classes where you work in bigger um, sorry, smaller groups of students, tutor led, 15, 20 students, something like that. If you're a scientist, you'll also have lab work. And there'll be lots of opportunities to do projects and lots of pieces as well. At Oxford and Cambridge, you get all of those things. We offer those things across the board. But we offer something on top of that as well, which I think is really at the core of what we do. In Oxford, we call it our tutorial system. In Cambridge, it's called the tutorial system. But it is essentially two different names for the same thing. And what it means is that whichever subject you do, you will find yourself for an hour or two or three hours a week working in very, very small groups, sometimes just you, sometimes two students, sometimes three students, with a tutor who is an expert in the subject that you are studying. And when I say an expert, I really do mean an expert, not just in the broad area that you're studying, but really within the particular topic that you're doing. So if you are that term studying 16th century Spanish history, for example, you will be working with someone who is writing books and articles and doing research on 16th century Spanish history, and their work is on all the reading lists in all universities, and you get the chance to work intensely with them. We deliberately choose our tutors so that they are very research active, and they choose to work in our system because as well as doing the research, they also get the chance to teach incredibly good students who will need some of them later on. But what the tutorial and supervision system gives you is a chance to interact with those people and to do it in a way that is not very, very formal and syllabus-led. So the syllabus for your subject, whatever you do, the kinds of things you do are the same, no matter which college you study at, and I'll explain how it works later. But within that, there's an enormous amount of range, there's an enormous amount of opportunity for you to work with your tutors to decide what you want to specialise in, what you want to work on. And the tutorial system breaks down really into two separate flavours of what kind of subject you do. So if you do a maths or science-based subject, your supervision or tutorial hour will usually be based around problem sheets that you'll be given the week before, you'll be given a week to work on them. It's very different from the kind of problem sheet you might be given in school or college, because we usually don't expect to be able to finish it. Some of the questions are too difficult to finish, and that's deliberate. And the idea of the problem sheet is to give you a starting point for discussion within the tutorial, where you will work through problems and principles arising out of those. Those problem sheets will link into the lectures and labs that you're doing as well, so it all fits together. If you are doing a humanities or social science subject, your tutorial or supervision will almost always be essay-based. So we will give you a title and a reading list uh, a week before a tutorial or supervision, and then leave you alone entirely to do exactly what you want to do in terms of producing an essay. It's very, very different from the kinds of essays that you have written at AS and that you will write at A2. Very much not a question of marking criteria. We don't formally assess the work that you're doing your supervision. They are a space in which you are free to do what you want, as long as you turn up with something interesting to say, something that you have written, you can have a discussion with the tutor who is there. That is the point. And that's really what drives your learning forward. I'm sure the students will describe later how the tutorials will shape their week, but it's very much something you work towards a cycle, sometimes working very steadily and doing a little bit of work every day, more usually leaving it all for the last two or three days and doing everything for four. Yes, right, good. <laughs> 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 But I think it does give you something a little bit more than some universities give you. All universities give you a great learning experience, but the tutorial system is a chance to go into greater depth to cover simply more stuff. So you will come out not only knowing a lot more about a particular subject that you do, but you will also come out with all the skills that you get from a tutorial or supervision, where the, where the system is really about interacting with somebody, <coughs> making an argument, having a discussion. So able to formulate your ideas, able to talk about your subject, but also <coughs> use those skills in any other area. And that, I think, is one of the major reasons employers love Oxford graduates. Tutorial and supervision teaches you stuff, but it also teaches you how to think. So for me, that is what sets us apart. And I think if we do do a subject that we like, the next question for you is whether you like the idea of the tutorial or supervision system. It's worth saying that it suits a particular kind of student. We're going to talk about this when we talk about the admissions process. Students who are 
very clever, first of all, and also who are incredibly interested in the project and actually want to do the amount of work that we think they're asking to do. Because outside of tutorial supervision, we leave you pretty much free to do the work as you want to do it, but we set a lot of it. And we expect you to want to do that work. We're not going to push you to do it. We're not going to kind of, you know, put time table your day. That's absolutely up to you. But we expect you to want to do the work, to come along and want to discuss it and choose it. So I think the tutorial system really suits students who are very smart and very interested. Now, what about the college system? This is, I think, the thing everybody knows about Oxford and Cambridge, that in order to be a member of Ivy University, you have to be a member of one of its colleges. And that is how it works for us. And it's a great system. It gives you huge advantages. Again, this is something the students will talk about later. But you basically get a community of a very small number of students where you almost certainly know everybody by the end of the first or second year. So a community of 200, 300, 400 students in a college environment. But there are about 30 colleges in each university, and they go to make up uh, the universities of 16,000 students in the world class resources. So what you're getting is a mini university within a big university. Colleges don't specialise in particular subjects exclusively. All of them do a mixture of subjects, so you don't find yourself simply meeting people doing one subject, and you do get the chance to meet a lot of individuals who aren't doing your subject. So it's much more like the experience in other universities when you get to the second or third year. Most universities will often find in the first year really only the doing the subject, which is fine, but in Oxford and Cambridge you get much more than that. Now colleges are homes for our students, they offer all the things you would expect, accommodation for at least two of the three or four years of your course, uh, social spaces, IT resources, catering facilities, sports facilities, all of that, you would expect that many universities have that you want to do. But colleges also have a really important academic role to play. So there will be somebody in your college, your uh, director of studies or your personal tutor, depending on which university you're in, all the different things, but the same idea. You will have an academic in your subject who is responsible for finding you the tutors that I've described in the tutorial structures. So it's not the case that you just get taught in your college. Um, you go where the experts are, and the tutors are scattered across all the different colleges. Uh, you will be found a tutor in your specialist area, and you'll go to them maybe just for weeks or for a term while you're studying their specialist subject. And someone in your college will have oversight of that. They will also be able to talk to you and very close contact with you to make sure that your work is going well and you are happy. So it is a very intensive system, you get a lot of attention. I think that's one of the huge benefits of the college system. It's a very weird system, you've never designed a university like that probably from scratch, but it works incredibly well, and I think it gives you the best of both worlds. Very small environment, but they the very good, big, resource intensive university. I think though, and we can talk more about this later, that the college system is not as important when you're making a decision. It certainly doesn't matter which college you go to. Um, students, and um, I'm the same from my college when I was in Cambridge, develop a huge loyalty to their college, and their college is absolutely the best one, but they all say that, and the colleges really are much more similar than they are different. So the rule in Oxford Cambridge, and we'll go into more detail if you have questions about that, is that you can choose a college if you want to go. And for me, the college choice and where you end up is actually much less important than choosing the right subject. Wherever you go, there will be tutors to look after you, and our application system is set up so that you're not disadvantaged by either choosing a college or not choosing one, or choosing a particular college, and we'll unpack more of that later on. So I think that it's the tutorial system, and then it's the college system. Those are the things that you're looking at after you've decided whether you're going to go. And as I say, it's a system that suits a particular group of students, and Carolyn will now take you through exactly how you go about choosing that particular kind of system. <laughs> So there's no kind of one blueprint for the kind of student that we want at Oxbridge. We like diversity, we like a range, but it's going to be very boring for us if we teach the same kind of person again and again. But the things that we are looking for amongst all our applicants, I mean, obviously, as Izzy says, somebody has to be academically able. Consider that the bottom line. You wouldn't be even considering Oxbridge your parents, your, your school would not supporting you, be supporting you in your application if you weren't considered to be one of the, the top notch academically. But that's not sufficient. <coughs> you need to be academically able because the courses are huge intellectual challenges. They are short terms. You've got eight week terms. There's a lot of material to get through in eight weeks. This is not a course you'll be sleepwalking through. You have to hit the ground running. You've got to be able to attack new material, to, to be fresh to it and to be able to deal with it as it comes in without actually any sort of stumbling. So as I'm sure he's going to tell you, you have to be up for that challenge to begin with. But then we're also looking for people who are not just academically able but have what we call potential 
And this means, can you use what you learn and do interesting things with it, or develop interesting ideas? Again, this latches into the tutorial, the supervision system. It's not, you know, you can go to lectures, you can understand the material, but can you come up with some interesting thoughts, some interesting ways to tackle the problems? You know, it's, again, a matter of potential. Can you think beyond what you're just being taught in lectures? Can you kind of join the dots behind the scenes? Can you read beyond what you're just being taught in Italy? Are you kind of able to develop from what we're just giving you? As if you consider that the bare bones, are you somebody who's then going to flush it out? And then maybe go into something really interesting with that qualification when you've got your degree at the end of the university. And the third thing that's important is, again, as you said, we're looking for people who have a passion, or at least an enthusiasm, for their subject. You will do a lot better in your subject and in your work if you're doing a topic that you really love. <coughs> and so we look for evidence of academic ability, academic potential, and an interest and enthusiasm in your subject. And all of our admissions process and all the different things we take into account really narrows down to assessing those three things. So for example, I've talked about your academic ability. Well, the obvious thing we'll look at is your predicted grades that your school gives you on your, on your application form. They will be good. Of course they're good. Your school won't be putting you forward unless they're expecting you to get your A's and A stars, getting good grades in the most important A levels for your subject. We will look at your GCSE record. Again, it differs perhaps between the two universities. I, you know, I won't pay so much attention to a GCSE record. You know, some A's and A stars are good, but I'm not sitting through counting how many you've got. Equally, if you get 13 A stars at GCSE, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're an ideal candidate. All it tells me is you're very good at passing GCSEs. It doesn't necessarily mean you've got everything else packed out in order that we need for you to be an Oxbridge student. But we'll look at your GCSEs and consider them. Now, at Cambridge, we will look at your AS module scores. This is a very important part of our process, and I believe it's not for Oxford. You don't look at them. But if, when you apply to Cambridge, we will ask you for all your module scores. And we think this is a very good predictor of how you will do academically, how you will cope with the coursework, because we see how that tracks your um, students' final scores. It's also interesting for me because you have chosen to choose, you've chosen to study those A-level subjects. I want to see how well you are performing at exam situation in the subjects that you are most interested in. And I think that's the best sort of trace about how you are academically. So we will ask for your module scores. And again, I'm being quite honest, you've got your, you will have a much better chance if you're getting in the 90s for your three key subjects. I know some of you may well be taking more, more than three subjects, but let's just concentrate on you know, either your three best subjects, or maybe if you're doing, going for a sciences, there may be particular things like the maths and the physics or the chemistry that are more important. Or depending on which degree you, you're studying for. But either your three best or the three most relevant. We have, we have the, the, the luxury of choosing from students who are getting over 95% in, in all three, and as, or as an average, some students who get even higher marks. It doesn't mean that that's you know, the sole cutoff level. That is just perhaps an average. We'll take some who are below who we think show amazing potential and, and you know outstanding thinking capabilities. So it's it's just a very rough guideline, but you might as well know who the competition is if you're going to go up for Oxbridge entry. And obviously, we'll look at your um, school reference, and what they give you about your you know again your potential, your academic ability, and what it is actually like to teach you as students. So that's your academic ability. Now, in terms of Assessing your potential, can you think beyond what you've just been taught at school? Well, of course, that's a lot of what the interview is about. You know, we'll be giving you problems at interview where we don't necessarily expect you to know the answer to. You'll be very used to in your A-level courses, this is a question about this, this is a question about this, this is a question about this. It's all very predictable. One might ask you a question where you've actually got to bring two different areas of physics or physics and maths together, and you've got to bring them back together to be able to get the answer to the problem. We might ask you um, questions. Well, the idea is to 
ask you that, to be a mathematician, we'll get you sketching a graph. And we don't expect you to know what the graph looks like. That would defeat the point. We're interested in how you think. And so it's much of a discussion about the work. And if you like, this is almost like what it's going to be like in a supervision or a tutorial. You're having a discussion about the work. You can have wrong ideas, but we can work with wrong ideas. What we don't want is students who don't have any ideas in the first place. We want to know that we can talk with you about the work, that you've got some ideas to throw into the next, you know, whether it's literature or whether it's maths. So again, the interview process, and everybody has to go through an interview if you want to do Oxbridge. Everybody gets interviewed. It is just really to see what you can do. And you should see it as a chance to show off to us what we can do. We get the luxury of getting to know you much better. So academic potential is accessory interview. It's all, we also look at, um, we, we make you do admissions tests in certain subjects. Again, it's very subject specific. We can answer particular ones. But for example, in the, the physical sciences, if you apply to read maths at Cambridge, or maths at Cambridge is a completely different kettle of fish from maths at A level. We want to know that you really, really do love maths in the way you need to do maths at Cambridge. And I can say that because I've got maths degree, so I'm very rude about it. Okay. So you, we make you do an admissions test, which is supposed to connect to your innate understanding. So not what you've learned at A level, but can you be shown a neat trick, and then can you see how to apply it to this integral or this equation? Okay. So can you pick up an idea quickly that you've not seen before? And for example, there are, there's other tests like thinking <coughs> skills assessment, testing just critical thinking, your ability to unpack an argument, your ability to analyze something. Stuff which is, you learn as part of your A-level, but it's also an innate skill. And again, that's all about this potential. Are you going to be interesting people to teach? Are you going to have interesting ideas? Are you going to take what we teach you and then run with it and go and do something amazing? That's really all connected with that. And then in terms of an enthusiasm <laughs> for your subject, this is something you need to be thinking about now. This will come out in your interview. It's also part of your personal statement. How can you demonstrate to me that you know what you want to study and that you're really positive about what you want to study? And again, it changes for courses. It's very important for things like medicine or for engineering that are not taught at, at, the, at A level. So how do you know you want to be an engineer? How do you know what engineering is? You know, do you go and build things in the shed at the bottom of your garden? Or have you done some interesting work experience in an engineering firm? Have you been to some lectures? Are there particular magazines you read or is, you know, TV programs you watch? How can you demonstrate to us that you are interested in this subject and that you have pursued this interest in your subject outside of just your A-level studies at, at school and at college? So really, what you should be doing now, I know it seems early, and this would apply to whatever university you apply to, think how you can use the time between now and your actual application to kind of get evidence that edge. What books can you read? What lectures could you go to? Could you try and find some work experience that might be vaguely related to what you want to study? It's all obvious, but don't leave it to the last minute. You know, try and start thinking about, again, just that demonstrating the interest. And so all of these things get taken together. So remember, <coughs> the interviews will get cause a lot of stress. They get the bad press, but they are really only a small part of the process. We will be looking at your module scores. We'll be looking at your school reference, your personal statement. We'll be combining everything together and trying to get an all-round picture of you. And you will put in your application early. If you want to apply to Oxbridge, your application has to go in earlier than for the other subjects, 15th of October. The we will then assess the applications. Again, there's a slightly different policy between colleges and even between universities. But at Cambridge, we attempt to interview between sort of 85 and 90 percent of all applicants. So if we think you have a very good chance of getting in, or even the slightest chance of getting in, we will give you an interview. Right? We do deselect some people, but we tend to interview far more than we have places for because, again, we think the interview is a chance for you to show us what you can do to let you shine. Now, I believe at Oxford you interview far fewer 
we do, and I think that there's a sort of a key difference. I think we're looking for exactly the same things, but we go about finding them in very slightly different ways. So where Carolyn said uh, that Cambridge looks at AS module models because they feel that that is predictable for them for success in the degree, we use a much more extensive just sort of testing subject by subject. So we've devised a set of different tests for almost every subject now at Oxford. I'd say 90% of the subjects have what we call an aptitude test. Mm -hmm. And that's giving us the same information, I think, that Cambridge is probably getting from its AS module survey. And really, we've, we've just found that our tests predict very well how people do in our degrees. But the other crucial difference to the Cambridge is that we use our tests very rigorously to deselect a lot more people before interview. So we agree the interview is like a kind of mini tutorial, that's why we do it that way. Um, and we're, we're looking at how you think or what you know. It isn't really something you can be very heavily prepared for, although you should take a chance to do a rocket and get over your nerves and plan. But for us, our tests tell us, we think, who is sort of in the frame that year, who has demonstrated the, the aptitude, not the, the talk knowledge, but the, the understanding that Karen was talking about earlier. And as a result of that, we actually try to interview only about three people from each place, which means that in our most uh, Competitive subjects in the law, in economics, management, medicine, for example, we are not even interviewing half of our applicants. So 40 to 45 percent of most of the competitive subjects. The point of, of slimming it down at that stage for us is to be able to give you a few more interviews when you're in Cambridge, uh, when you're in Oxford for interview. Uh, that's a case graduate, isn't it? Um, you can when you're in Oxford, you'll have at least two interviews in the college that you're interviewing at. But you'll usually have an interview in another college as well, maybe two or three other colleges. So we're getting a little bit more coverage, but the idea is to give us exactly the same information. But in terms of preparing, it's exactly the same for us as for Cambridge. Make sure that you are very fluent in your subject, make sure you know why you want to study it, mm -hmm. and a saying from a sort of a, a, a humanities and social sciences perspective, where parents can give you a science perspective, the most important thing the advice I could give you in the kinds of subjects that, that I'm interested in, history and English or languages, is to just read, read, read. Read more books. I don't mind which ones they are, as long as you've thought about them. That will make you smarter, it will make you more interested in the subject, and that will give you the kind of preparation that you're not just going yeah. And in fact, there's a very good point there. I was talking about work experience. You know, that's a great thing if you are able to get it. But it's not enough that you've just done the work experience. What, what have you learned from your work experience, for example? It's things like that. It's, it's, again, just think about it, it's not what you do, it's just kind of what you've, what you've made of it, what you've learned from it, and can you, can you talk about that? And again, this idea of preparation, don't. We can spot people who've been coached for interview a mile off. You can over prepare. The main thing is you get over the embarrassment of the sound of your own voice, get over the embarrassment about talking over your ideas. And this is where your, your teachers, your, your family can help you. Just get used to talking about yourself and what you think. And that's the crucial thing, not, not to get too time to mind about that. So, after the, uh, again, the, the methods differ slightly, but for us, we'll have you, again, as you've learned, you apply to a college. Even though you're going for an Oxford or a Cambridge degree, you will apply to a certain college and you have to you have to go through a college. You will have we hold our interviews in the first two weeks of December. We will then make decisions and you either get accepted or you get in which case you get a conditional offer for 20 on your A levels. You will get rejected, in which case you then are now out of the process for Cambridge. Or we have what's known as a pool system where other colleges can choose you. So the idea is, again, as Lizzie said, it doesn't matter in the end which college you apply to. If you're good enough, we've got all these different mechanisms and the pool system is our own system to make sure that we get the best students regardless of which college they apply to, that we get the best students coming to us. And all of that happens in January. So really, by the end of January, you should know you should either have a conditional offer or know that you're then looking at the other colleges on your year platform. And again, also does the same thing, but just to be difficult, just to be different. Um, rather than split those two processes up, we do our first round of interviews, if you like, and our pool interviews at the same time. So in Oxford, you, again, you go through a particular college, and for both Oxford and Cambridge, you can either nominate a college or you can make what's called an open application, and we will nominate a college for you. So we will pick a college that, for whatever reason, that year has fewer applications to the subject. That will become the college that looks for application. People worry about this enormously because they think if they make what's called an open application, they don't choose to somehow they will be less committed to Oxford. Actually getting hold of your application in Oxford, I think it's true in Cambridge, we don't know yeah. whether you chose us or whether you were allocated to us. It's all done century by an algorithm. We just get a bunch of forms. And most of us have worked in different colleges and different universities. We don't have that kind of loyalty that the students develop in the college. What we want, because we teach students for colleges, are the best students for their course. So our interest as tutors is going to be best for history at Oxford, for example. 
We are not going to ask why you chose certain whatevers. We probably didn't. Um, and at Oxford, what we do is interview you at that first college, the one you've chosen or the one that's been allocated to you. And then we, if we want to interview you again, we interview you while you're up there. Again, first week of September, but we do all of our interviews. We keep you there for a bit longer, three or four days, uh, put you up free of charge in a college, and we make all of our decisions at the end of that period. But again, by early January, you know the answer. You know whether you've got an offer, a conditional offer, or you haven't, and then you move on with the rest of it. So, I'm not sure what else there is. Um, slight difference in offer levels. Um, yeah, uh, for, for Oxford, for, for uh, humanities, social sciences, the offer level is still three A's at A level. Mm -hmm. uh, in sciences and maths and medicine, it's A star and two A's, and in a couple of courses, two A stars and an A. But it's slightly different. Yes, our standard offer is an A star and two A's, or this is the generic offer. There are exceptions, though, for example, if you're doing maths. We may specify the A star to be in further maths. We will also specify what you get in what we call six term examination papers. So Those sort of extra papers do make you take if you want to do maths. Be aware that some colleges will ask for more. And that there is a college um, dependency, my own college, we will get, always go for A star in two ways. Other colleges may make you work harder. If you're doing more than three A levels, be aware we may ask you for something in your fourth A level. So it may be that at that fourth A level is not so crucial, but to me I like commitment. If you said you're going to do four A levels, I want you to carry on and do four A levels, because I'm fed up with applicants who have six A levels on the form, as soon as they get their offer they drop three of them. Right, that's, that's kind of, just, that's not really playing the game. But I'm going to make you, you know, an A star, two A's, and then a B or a C in the fourth one. I don't really care so much what you get in that, I just want you to keep with that commitment of getting it. So again, it is a little bit college specific, but generally ours is A star and two A's. It's not college specific, in Oxford, it's subject specific, again, just to be different. So each subject will have a fixed offer. Um, so when you look through our perspectives, again, it, as you moved around the colleges, and I think you do that a little bit more than Cambridge, a bit more shuffling, that's why we have a, a subject specific offer to, to know what you're going into. Um, Again, it's, it's, it's going to be between two A stars and A and three A's. It's incredibly rare for us to offer on four A levels, although I know that all of you standing in Farnborough will be doing four, and that's good. Um, it will give you that breadth, but our offer will be on three, um, and occasionally on four. And one just thing that I haven't mentioned, but it's just worth floating past, is that we are aware that sometimes people have extenuating circumstances. I think, I'm sure it's true with Oxford, but certainly Cambridge. If there's any reason that there's some contextual reason why you have not performed as well as one might have expected, your teachers might have expected because of illness, a disability, or something going on at home, or you know, if you have teaching shortages at school, whatever, you are, you know, we can make allowance for certain certain circumstances. So again, you do have any extenuating circumstances like that, it's worth checking whether you qualify. And it's not in any way, you know, marking you out for special you know, special treatment or anything, it's just to make sure that we're going to be fair on you if you, you know, for some reason your your AS modules haven't been as good as anybody would say. So that be aware that there are things like that. We're just telling you the generic answer and maybe two or three times of the offers. We can change the offers if we think there's a good reason that it's not your fault that you're unlikely to achieve that offer, but we still want you. But you know, that's very rare, but be aware that we have got some flexibility. It's not not all hard and fast. Probably enough of us speaking. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you can say your name and what you're doing. You can stay sitting. Okay. Um, I'm Emma. I'm a Hamilton College of Cambridge and I'm studying EDU, which is Education with Ancient Grammar. I'm Ellie. I'm also at Hamilton College of Cambridge and I'm studying MML, which is um, Body and Medical Language. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm also reading French and Spanish. I'm at St. John's College. Hi, I'm Robin. Uh, I was at St. John's College, Oxford. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm at Lady Marble, Paul College, Oxford. I'm Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm doing music at this College. Hi. I wonder if you want to say anything about your experience, or how you found it, or I think in terms of the interview process, I think it's kind of quite a lot of people get quite scared and quite nervous when you kind of come up and you've got an interview and start worrying a lot about what is going on. I think the 
nursery instead are a good thing. I don't think you can throw in not being a nurse, but do try and enjoy them. I don't think I've got a I quite enjoy it. Actually, they're quite a bit fun if you kind of let yourself enjoy it. I know it sounds really odd because you're going there and it's potentially a better But it is quite a bit fun and do try and kind of relax it. Certainly, the first one's a bit tense, but after that, it is it's quite a bit some of these nice videos that like me where I actually fell in the door of my Spanish interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, the thing with the interviews is that they are there to sort of teach you to think in a slightly different way. So I'm a linguist. I haven't touched maths or anything to do with graphs since year 11. So I was in my French interview and I was given a graph and my first thought was, ah, how am I even going to do this? But I thought it through, I spoke about it, I thought it was a disaster, but it obviously wasn't. So I think for the interviews, is go, don't have anything in mind when you're going into them because you will be completely surprised. Yeah, that's a bit daunting, but you know, they're, like Joe said, they're fun, they're sort of, they're a really good insight into the whole tutorial system. I just wanted to um, say something about course tutorials because I came to this meeting two, uh, two years ago, quite strongly set on PPE, and then after this I decided to connect with me. And then toy with maths and that was me. And now I do classics uh, and it's definitely my decision. So I definitely think uh, as we said the subject choice is the most important thing. Um, so definitely know your subject, but also consider things that aren't necessarily talking or something you have to do. And I think the interview is quite good because they are going to start with, but they're actually really interesting. You are speaking with experts for the subject. Um, they're, they're not trying to trip you up, they're just trying to um, talk you through and see what your, your thought process is like. Um, Oxbridge in general, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, I think everyone would agree There's, there is a lot of pressure. Um, the workload is intense and they're very short term. You have a lot of work packed into those eight weeks, but it is rewarding and the work is interesting and if you do have a passion for your subject then, then it makes it worthwhile but um, if you know what you're getting into yourself it's just like <laughs> I don't know if they should have some specs but they do play hard as well as well <laughs> um, we've also got to get the balance right and the first term I don't know about but I, I just found that quite tricky because you're sort of thrown into this whirlwind of essays and deadlines and supervisions for the words that you don't really understand, you don't really know what you're doing, that, you don't really know what you're doing, seven or things. But once you get into the pattern of it, you get into the thing of things, do you find time to socialise? Um, there's so much to do with extra grip. It's insane. The amount of societies and different things, the opportunities that you get is amazing, really. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think just on the same point, kind of working hard playing my like kid, it is very important to have something which um, get away from your work at times because there is so much that you can get bogged down. And you do sometimes get a point where it's just like I don't feel like I can do any more, and you need something else to do just to take your mind off. I think it's equally important to make. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I was like the first day at Oxford, I thought, oh my word, everyone's going to be so super intelligent, I'm going to feel so stupid. But you get there and people are normal, which sounds surprising, but they're from six forms just like this, um, they've got similar backgrounds, they've got completely different backgrounds, they come from it, they saw all over the world and you meet a real mix of people. So you don't feel like you're going into a completely elitist, sort of private school dominated world, because it's not really like that at all. But, <laughs> And like, I was really worried when I went there first about fitting in and stuff. But you do find like your own social dynamic. You find people that you can really like bounce ideas on that you really enjoy to have. So you don't have to be scared about it. Like everyone's scared on their first day. Don't be wrong. Everyone's nice to me. <laughs> I think probably all scared on your first day. College deadline for our application to Oxford and Cambridge. Please write this down. 
is 25th of September, because we have to then process your application. So while we have to get into new class by the 15th of October, in order to make sure that this is really correct, perfect, with the fabulous <coughs> reference, which has been checked and double checked, and then read over by me as well, and that there are no mistakes on it, it has to be a colleague by the 20th. We will choose that, signed it, done by the 25th of September. So that means, those of you who are thinking about the application, you actually have to do some work in June. Yeah, I'll leave that sorted. How do you do research? And the second question was, um, how do you do the extended project? We should take the research question, seeing as Cambridge is very heavy on the AS modules with assessing candidates. One or two resets are fine. Everybody has an off day. Now, I don't. I would worry if you are having to resit a large number of your exams. Doesn't mean necessarily that you're any, you know, less smart. But unfortunately, the way that the examination system works within Oxford and Cambridge is this end of year exams, and there are no resets available there. So we need a sense that you can cope with that kind of pressure, with that kind of timetable. So as I say, one or two resets are not a problem, but if it's a large number, then without an obvious contextual reason why it's exceptional, then I would, I would question whether you're applying to the right place. And the EPQ the extended project. Um, we deliberately don't take a view about whether we, we only do it in offers. We don't take a view about whether you should do it because some colleges let you do it, some colleges only let some people do it. We don't take a view about that. But I think I would say to people thinking you're fine, if you get a chance to do it, and I would say that not as a strategic thing, it's not sort of in the boxes, it's that it is the closest, particularly in essay based subjects, that you get to the kind of individual research, if you like, that we ask our students to do. And it's also an incredibly good thing to have under your belt for an interview. So, in a history interview, I might actually start by saying to somebody, What do you want to talk about? And if they want to talk about their extended project, you'll be able to do it well, not just tell me what's in it, but you know, analyse it. Then that gives them a sort of sure footing. You know, I'd like people to have something they feel comfortable with. Farmer extended project, and although um, the extended project I did wasn't directly linked to French and Spanish, it was more Spanish and law, I still felt still so much out of it. So, learning how to switch um, resources, learning how to do footnotes, all that sort of thing. That all, um, <laughs> yeah, it was generally very, very helpful. I'm glad I didn't did it, even though it didn't come off my interview. <coughs> so, I think if you're considering doing it, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, I did the farm book qualification as well. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the essays at Cambridge um, or like there, you get a supervision, you get set an essay, you haven't studied the book before, you have no idea what you're doing as such. So you're left to read your own resources and read as critical critical guides. Um, and so the it is a good way to um, start that process. So I get used to finding your own resources. <laughs> For any like potential users out there, there's um, there's a lot of essay writing that books you might not expect this to be an out there for us. So I would I would recommend you come and see the project this to really, just to get used to it. Yeah, um, I thought it was very useful weekly and it was something to have. They didn't ask about an interview, but they could easily come up and felt comfortable with them. That would give them some Any more questions?
Did anybody hear the question? The question was to Robin, how to be made a subject first, or generally? Uh, well, the reason that I started off on uh, EPA was trying to remove these because people said uh, if you're good at maths and you like history, that's good. Uh, and that's not the wrong idea to take because obviously that's you need to have an interest in the process of philosophy. Uh, you can't just base it on what you're good at, and which obviously you probably want to base it on. So then, uh, and then we went to maths, which was my best subject, uh, and didn't, wasn't particularly attractive on the course, uh, thought that I wanted something with a bit more variety in it, which is why I was trying to find classics for the business of a mix of language, literature, history, and everything else. That went along to a Really good thing to do when you're applying is ignore everyone who says, oh, this is a really good degree to do. You're going to be guaranteed a job if you do this. There's lots of people who told me I should do law. And you know, it is an amazing degree, but I always wanted to do languages. And it was only when I really just sat down um, and thought about it that I realised that, yes, I'm sure law is a wonderful degree, but it was what I actually wanted to spend three years of my life doing. So it's like cheesy as it sounds, follow your heart. Or I hate myself saying that already. <laughs> But um, don't be put off by people telling you what you should be doing. Go with what you think is right. I'm in a, a problem. I changed my mind quite a lot. Through the my two years here, I was Spanish, then law, and I finally was like, and sound like God switched to make them out of that. But um, <laughs> for me, I was kind of thinking of doing law almost until I started writing my application. And then and over one of the summers, the summer between my first and second year at college, I did a research project down at Southampton University, which was chemistry, just because I kind of saw it and was a number of fun things to do. And loved it so much that I thought, you know what, why don't I study chemistry at uni? And that was kind of like eight weeks doing the same subject, and I thought, yeah, I can actually, I enjoy doing this for a long period of time. Having said that, it's kind of hard to find an opportunity like that, but it really does have to be something you love doing. Can I just add, I think there's a very important point made there about the, the worth of going to open days within, you know, <laughs> not just Oxbridge, all the universities, go into the department, speak to students doing the subject, see what kind of lab, you know, that have example, you know, if you want to be a scientist, example of the kind of lab projects you'd be doing. And so you really have to just investigate and, and the best way to go into that day it's almost like try it on the side, see what it might be like being a chemistry or a Spanish student in this particular department, in this particular university. I think you can learn an awful lot from that. Um, another thing to add is don't limit yourself. I mean, this isn't necessarily just at Oxford. But um, if, you've got, if you've got interests in a variety of things, chances are there's a degree out there that covers everything that you're interested in. Because I'm sort of initially got just interested in like, English and drama. But I've now got a course that focuses on English and drama, but also touches on psychology, development, globalisation, even bits of economics and law. So really look into the depth of the courses, search on you pass, I'm sure you like, absolutely. So yeah, just really look into it. I've got Jennifer here. So just sort of following up that concept really from the admissions point of view around the sort of work that you're assuming so not uh, we're going to the classes, but other than that, it's really interesting, and again, we do this very slightly differently, um, but there are some courses, and an Oxford statistical course, at A levels, that you have to have courses, so you're absolutely right, chemistry and one other science or maths is essential for medicine. For uh, engineering, you must have maths and you must have physics. You preferably have further maths as well. So there are a list of things that you have to have. You couldn't do a French degree without French, for example. You could absolutely do a classics degree where we would teach you Latin and Greek from scratch. Um, there are other languages that you wouldn't necessarily have a chance to do. College Russian would be a classic example, but there are a lot of them from scratch. You could teach you how to do that. There's a very clear list on our, on our website about what you must have. Um, Oxford's view beyond that is we don't mind what you have. 
beyond the must haves. But I think Cambridge would be very slightly different in some subjects. So for us, um, there are some degrees, that, like history from some point, I think I must have a theory of the No, they're actually knowing that it's a must have. The law would be the other slightly surprising example. You don't need to have law, but there's nothing that you can have. have. Um, so we're, you know, we're quite flexible beyond the essential. And I think what we're looking for is a good set of A levels that has prepared you to be the kind of student that but that can come in all sorts of flavors. Um, and one very important thing to say, particularly for Oxford students, that we don't have a blacklist of A levels, big universities have a blacklist of A levels. Some universities have A levels, maybe not more than one of. We don't have that. As long as it's sort of interesting and relevant to build you up eventually, the classic example would be someone applying to English literature. We expect you to have either English literature or English language literature A level. But beyond that, if you have drama, if you have theatre studies, if you have uh, media studies, sociology, we're entirely happy, um, as long as you can convince us that you want to study the option of read novel or phone space. Yes, that's good. And just to remind you all, it's on the website. You can also pick up the perspectives when they come out a little bit early for the rest of them. You look at your subject and they'll say um, essential or desirable A level subjects, or they'll not specify at all. So again, it goes on a course by course basis for all universities, but that's where perspectives can be very important. They can tell you what the, your, kind of the average offer, conditional offer is. They can also say that you need chemistry to read a biology to think about that. And my son did law at Oxford, he did French Spanish biology. Can I just repeat the answer? Yes, to the linguist, what did you do beyond college to make your language feel so good? Um, obviously, the thing with Turkey is uh, real health. Um, there's also a language school in Farden that I was teaching at the French and Spanish students. Um, and I also work with a French organisation for a week. Um, just anything really. Um, also, reading books, um, the admissions just said is a very good idea. Um, there's as many French books as you can. Um, and make sure you can analyse them as well, so really think about them. Detail and even things like listening to French radio, listening to watching French films, everything just kind of immerses you in the language. I mean, I didn't really do any sort of work experience in languages, um, but I think a lot of time what they're looking for is for you to sort of go out of the limits of A level and go out of the limits of the authors that everyone does for A level or everyone does for GCSE. And start and sort of taking your own initiative, find an author you know you're not being most famous, you might not have book Christmas literature written on him or her, but who you find interesting. And I mean especially with lots of languages because it is very, very literature based. Um, getting a lot of wide reading is very important. But equally like Ellie said, um, listening to a French Spanish book and you want to do radio. Um, getting out there and really getting to grips with the language, I think, and quite a language also the culture. I think that's sort of the best way to go about this. Any more questions? Oh, yes. And Diana and Leslie. I'll stick it. I'll stick um, basically, what we'll do, this is really, if you like, our first day of the Oxbridge process. Um, I have here a handout for you when you go, um, which gives you some key dates, including that deadline date. It also has two uh, punk sheets, the blue one and the yellow one. These are for the open days that we booked coaches. We just want to go to Oxford and Cambridge to book places at the university students to go after they've done their AS. So that's sort of the first part of the process. What we would like the students to do is come to the sessions that we are running between the three of us um, on things like preparation for admission tests we do not be exam. There'll be the open days, there's our big careers day, which is really long day, which is July. And I'm hoping that these guys will be back um, to um, offer a seminar just for the students as well. We'll also have some information about the written test process. The tutorials that we have after the AS results, the AS exam, sorry, so the June, July tutorial focus on applying to higher education at all employment and we call those the moving on tutorials that we forward. 
So that's the process that takes place in June, July. Um, in those tutorials, the students will be encouraged to think about what they're going to put in their policy statements. There will be guidance on writing their policy statements. The students who are applying for medicine vet, dentistry, Oxford, need to get their tutors, their tutors drafted their personal statements before finish in the summer. First draft of their personal statement. That really is important. Because we need to be thinking about it before we totally get over the summer. When we come back, if you are going to make a stupid an application, a student to make an application for what's called Cambridge, then you need to let us know because we're working to this tight deadline. So you need to see Diana from Cambridge, tell her that you're making an application, and tell her which college you want to apply to. And she will talk to you and say, actually, have you thought about this, and have you thought about that, and thought about this, and thought about that, and are your grades okay, and show you your grades and everything. And Leslie will do exactly the same for Oxford. <coughs> um, for Oxford, I think Leslie probably has more work because Oxford has a lot of tests. And so you will get guidance on your That's not to say that Diana doesn't do any work on the <laughs> There just aren't quite as many of them. Um, but um, there will be guidance on, on admission tests. There will be a support session in June and introduction. Well, do not students underestimate how hard those admissions tests are. So they're not easy. And students every year don't get an interview. They didn't do well in the They really came to see us. So we're putting on at lunchtime, in the autumn term, support sessions, and students don't come up. And they're three hour papers, most of two and a half to three hour papers. And you've probably never sat a three hour paper before. So you need the practice. So please take it from me. Last year, more than half the people got to be the few hours. If you won't just need to So this is really important. So these people know everything. They have plenty of more things to know about each other. And if you can't find them, they're both personal tutors. They're opposite. One is the gender corridor, and one is me. Okay? But it really is crucial to see tellers in the place not to be Because it needs to find them well. It's very, very hard to get And to do it properly. I mean, you give it to us on the 14th of October. Please don't. Um, but you won't miss the <coughs> If you give it to us on the 25th, I guarantee you will get the best one for the We might have very And I know the tutors are very good. Um, thank you Any more questions? Well, I'm very bad. Guys, the question was, what's it like to be in the tutorial and work with the experts? The tutorial is something they are really, really good fun. They are really interesting, and if you do really love your subject, working with someone who knows that much about it is just really, really enjoyable. And I think. It is probably the best part of the system, the tutorials, the fact that we're working so closely. I mean, I have two to one tutorials. And it is just really, it is intense, it is hard work, and you have to do a lot of work to prepare for them. The tutors aren't, kind of, they don't want people wasting their time, so you have really got to do the work, do the work. <coughs> but they are really good fun, they're really interesting. And they are. I just to reiterate that, it's. I've had one on one tutorials as well, and it just, it's, it's obviously hard work, and afterwards, it's, you know, collapses afterwards, and I just presented it to the tutorial. But they're always very rewarding to have someone who's, who in my case, telling us an interview about her life, and to be uh, taught by someone who's allowed to express my ideas about uh, Latin tutorial uh, for an hour, and uh, it's just a great opportunity. But it's, We find ourselves sort of bonding with each tutor and bonding with people in your tutorials um, in a way that I, I can't imagine you do at any other university. You bounce off each other, 